Um, welcome everyone to this afternoon's breakout session. My name is Sylvia Sen, and um, I'm one of the executive directors at IFAC, and my responsibilities include uh, two core constituents, SMPs, or small and medium-sized practitioners, as well as uh, accountants who work in business and governments, so those who are CFOs and finance managers. And of course, working with those groups, we know that some of the emerging trends related to technology, globalization, changing business demands, new innovative business models, they're all changing the way we think about accounting and what's needed for business and government to still rely on accountants and the accountancy profession for the trust, integrity, and expertise that they've always represented. So it's great to be here. We are going to try to have a session where we invite your participation. If you have questions, please feel free to save them for the end of the session. And we will finish our session today at 4 o'clock, so we've got a good amount of time, which is great because we have a great lineup of panelists. I'm very lucky to moderate this session. We have three expert panelists with us today. And in terms of the order which they'll speak with you, let me first introduce Monica Forster. Monica Forster is from Brazil and she is the chair of IFAC's Small and Medium Practices Committee. She's been chair for two years, but a long-term member, I know this because I support that committee, so I get the privilege of working with Monica. And she's also the director for IBRICON and CSC, the two professional bodies in Brazil for their SMP committee. In terms of her own professional practice life, she's a partner at Confidor, an accounting, tax, and law firm with offices in Porto Alegre and Sao Paulo. And that's the best Portuguese I can share with you, I'm sorry. And then after Monica, we will have Mr. Thomas Calderon with us. And Thomas is a, has a PhD as a professor at the University of Akron's George W. Davro School of Accountancy. I can tell you, Thomas is very accomplished because he was very patient working with three top class women, our tough questions, he's ready today for us. Thomas has a long list of academic accomplishments. He's also editor of Advances in Accounting Education, a global journal that seeks to advance accounting education research and the scholarship of teaching and learning. Thomas also contributes his valuable time to a number of education initiatives throughout the US, and we're very pleased to have him with us. And last but not least, we're very lucky as well to have an important international representative with us we have Kim Gibson. Kim is a member of the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants, and she's been a member since January in 2016. In addition to that difficult work and challenging work stream, she's also global head of independence for Grant Thornton International and a partner with Grant Thornton LLP in the US. She's responsible for providing member firms with policy, guidance, and training relating to independence, very tough topic, and oversight of their automated global independent system. So if you've always wondered how large firms try to navigate the difficulties of independence and conflicts, she's going to be able to help you understand that. OK, without further ado, let's get started. And make yourselves comfortable. Please feel free to take your jackets off if you want. Let's enjoy ourselves. And let me invite Monica up here to have the first presentation. So good afternoon, everyone. And although I'm Brazilian, I will be presenting in Portuguese, in English. Uh, those that were uh, in events similar to Crescer in other countries know that I always do that. Although in the questions, I might try to speak a kind of a, a mix of Spanish and Portuguese uh, in case you need. The idea here first to start before the explanations of my colleagues is uh, to bring the global SMP trends and opportunities. This will be based on the results of the IFAC SMP survey 2018, so we do have very recent information and numbers to present and uh, mentioning what might be done, what shall be considered uh, in that purpose to make sure that SMPs are 
identifying which are the trends, which are the opportunities, and to make sure they are prepared for that. So only a, only a brief description of the survey to help understanding what is included on it. The SMP survey, global SMP survey, uh, aims to raise the voice and visibility of SMPs and learn about this constituency. Uh, considering the results of the survey, both IFAC and the local member organizations can better support the SMPs. The last survey, which was taken last year, 2018, had more than 6,000 responses from 150 countries, and it was available in 24 languages, what makes the process quite easier to make sure people understand what they are answering. One uh, interesting information is that from all respondents, 64% are sole practitioners or two up to five uh, partners and staff. So we did include it and had answers from very small SMPs in our survey. In this survey, we focus on three main areas of activities, which I'll briefly mention now. First, technology. Second, talent management, and third, other types of services, so what we call advisory services. First focus, technology. Technology indeed is a challenge for SMPs, but it is also an opportunity. Once the SMPs identify what is available, what is possible to be developed, and what might be offered to the clients, te technology becomes an opportunity to the SMPs. According to the survey, 38% view technology developments as a significant challenge. We did have huge variations in this perception depending on the region from the respondents, but this is an average result. And according to that, it is logical to identify, and this was observed in the survey, that 28% of the respondents plan to allocate more than 10% of revenue over the next 12 months on technology investment. This is very easy to understand. Technology is something that is already real, is already being faced by SMPs. Therefore, it, there's no way to pretend nothing is happening or that nothing needs to be done. So this is the reason why we understand this percentage is intended by SMPs. We need to keep in mind, however, that technology is not the only aspect when we think about transformation. Transformation also depends or is related to a business model, to strategy, to tools, to training and to people. All that working together that allows SMP to keep continuing and to increase. Which are the technology developments uh, which were highly rated according to the SMP survey? First of all, development of in-house skills and expertise in IT which represented 37% of the answers. We also had cloud for client's interface, both for adoption and use perspectives, and also the provision of business insights from data analytics and other related technology topics. One point important to remember is that due to technology, SMPs currently can serve clients anywhere. So you are not restricted to your geographical zone anymore due to the possibilities that are supplied by technology. So to be very practical and to identify the real world related to technology, I brought here five steps to embed technology in an SMP practice. First, address the long-term business strategy. What does it mean? It means to consider what is happening in the world and uh, how it will affect the practice. So SMPs ought to consider and to analyze about how technology can help to save time, to reduce the costs, 
to attract new staff, mainly from new generations, and also to maintain and add new clients. Obviously, when the firm thinks about developing a technology strategy, it is key that this technology strategy is totally aligned with the firm's strategy. Otherwise, the firm will try to develop something, but at the end of the day, it won't be possible because that technology purpose is not fit for purpose according to the reality of the firm. This is something sometimes we forget. The second step is uh, to do environmental scan of current and desired tech. And that means effort. The firms need to check what exists, what is available, if these available alternatives are adequate or are possible to be achieved by the firm, and based on that, to decide which will be the technology tools and alternatives that will be chosen. So it's not something uh, related to buying the first alternative or not checking what is available. One of the best ways to identify what exists is instead of receiving a simple visit of a provider to check on these fairs, events, what is available, what the other firms are adopting, to see how effective that alternative is. Third step, to formulate a realistic implementation plan. What does it mean? The firm needs to construct the project, the plan, and needs to review it periodically and to check and monitor if the results that are being seeked are being achieved. This needs to be part of the decision-making process. Otherwise, when the whole process is ended, the firm might identify that things didn't went as well as it was expected. So this needs to be kept in mind when controlling and developing that alternative. Fourth step, identify and support your internal technology champion. We know that the new generations mainly are very technology involved, technology experts, or perhaps technology addicted. So it is important that inside your firm, you identify that one that will be the person capable to be directly involved and responsible by all this process. Obviously, this key person, this champion, needs to receive full support and accompaniment by high management. Otherwise, this person won't have the energy and the support by the other people of the firm to proceed to what is needed. The last step, but not less important step related to technology, re relates to involving the firm's clients. So make sure your client know what are you dealing with in relation to technology and demonstrate to your client what will be available, what will add value to the client based on what you're developing in technology. Second activity, talent. We know how hard it is to attract and retain new talents. And the staff is the most valuable asset of the firm. According to the survey, 54% have difficulty attracting the next generation talent. And when we check the reasons for that, it's very interesting to see that we have quite diverse understandings on why it is so hard. So from one side, we had 66% uh, answering that there is lack of candidates with the right mix of skills. Once we know that it's hard to find the perfect one, the firm needs to keep in mind that CPD needs to be considered and applied over the time for all staff involved in the firm. But the firm also needs to consider that it's not only about uh, technical issues or technical discussions. The firm needs to focus also on new competencies for digital global reality. So we need to provide as a firm 
the best alternatives, the best updates, based, of course, on what is possible and what is available, considering uh, the money that is available for that, to make sure that the staff is being properly and maintained uh, adequate to the needs of the firm. The second highest rate was, which represented 57%, relates to competition from lar larger uh, firms. This is something that comes from ever and certainly will continue, so it was not surprising to identify. 44% to increase the opportunities in other fields, and 41% on the concern about work-life balance and uh, flexibility. We know that that pressure that in the past was so common, mainly in the audit area, to face busy season, to need to work for additional hours, it's very hard to get the new generation staff accepting and dealing properly with that. That said, uh, which are the most popular talent management initiatives that were introduced or planned for implementation in the next 12 months, considering the results of the global survey? Flexible working hours or uh, work days. Of course, it depends on the local legislation. Sometimes this is not allowed, but is one of the possible solutions. Technical training programs and direct incentive uh, or rewards for the staff. These were the highly rated uh, talent management initiatives. Also, and that is something that sometimes SMPs don't think about, the enhanced work environment. So to make an environment in such a way that the staff feels comfortable being there and working then there and feel really incentivated to continue at the firm. Once again, focusing on practice, which are five talent management initiatives that we might consider when we think about talent? First, more opportunities for learning and developing. That relates to possible scholarships, to paid study time, to prizes, and to regular training opportunities. The second initiative relates to extra responsibilities for rising starts. So it's not only about identifying that special talent, but also to provide uh, entrepreneurship opportunities to that person or to those people, to those staff members, to make sure they feel themselves challenging in a positive way and interested in remaining at the firm and growing inside the firm. The new generation mainly likes a certain level of pressure in this challenging aspect perspective. So this is, uh, would be, is very helpful when applied. The third initiative is to publicize firm's investment in training. We know that SMPs in general didn't use to make too much advertise. Indeed, there are even some legal limitations in some regions. But it is important for the firm to make sure that those potential talents know what is happening, know what is available inside the firm to make them interested in joining the firm. And that won't happen if a minimum kind of publicizing doesn't happen. We do have internet today, we do have all this social media available, which allow to make this uh, social uh, publications, letting the potential new staff know about what is available. For initiative, invest in technology and gadgets. I won't enter into details here because I already really, uh, mentioned that before when I spoke about technology, but if the firm wants to keep the staff interested in remaining at the firm, mainly the new generation, to have technology alternatives and tools is key. Last initiative relates to transparency around career plan. The new generation 
is based on a concept that I want to understand and I really want to trust on what is said and that what is promised effectively is done and is accomplished by the firm. So don't promise something that you as firm know won't be possible to achieve. In the past, sometimes it worked. With the new generation, it simply doesn't work. Let's move to the last activity uh, topic from the global survey, advisory services. We know, and this was identified by the survey, that the majority revenue in SMPs comes from traditional services. So from compliance, audit, taxation services. However, what was identified in this survey, it was already identified in previous surveys, but it presented really higher rates on this survey relates to the increase of advisory services. It represented 51% of the answers. So we identify by the survey a trend on moving to other types of services, especially related to advisory. That said, according to the survey, which are the main uh, advisory services that are being provided already now by SMPs. 53% of the respondents mentioned they render corporate advisory, what includes mergers, legal valuations, due diligence. 50% answered to be rendering advisory services related to management accounting, what means risk management, internal controls, and budgeting. The third was, which represented 31%, was on restructuring, insolvency, and liquidation, and 27% involved on advisory services on human resources, policies, and procedures. With all that said, I want to conclude bringing which are opportunities for SMPs considering the current global scenario. First, the value for expertise and insights. So the firms and the staff need to develop capability to offer and market new services. It's about reliance, it's not about only compliance. So be properly prepared from a technical perspective, from a technical aspect to render other types of, ser of services, identifying what is the real need of your client. Second, creating an ongoing relationship with clients. What is important here, as I just mentioned, to understand and listen to the client's needs. So act as a trusted business advisor. Make a difference to the client. If you're only bureaucratic on rendering the services, your client won't consider the firm, won't think on the firm to ask for something else. Consider the adoption of specialization or niches, which are be specialized, be an expert on a specific type of service, because then you get experience on that and your fixed cost becomes lower. So your margin becomes better when you sell your service. And last but not least, the importance of networks. Networks, alliances, independently of the type of relationship. In a global work, Word. It is extremely important to have good uh, this positive links, to be prepared to render different types of services, and also to have the possibility of references of clients. So all that together allows the firm to keep growing and be prepared to face the future. So concluding, it's important for the firm and for the practitioners to be proactive, not reactive. That will be key to face the challenges and to be future prepared. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Monica. And I remember when I was a young auditor in Canada, I worked for a firm that had three partners, and I remember when they give 
gave us new exciting projects to help grow the business. I felt it was such a great learning experience. Of course, we didn't have the responsibility, but they brought us along the process and it helped them take away some of their work, but it helped us learn the pressures of the business. So I think some of those great ideas and using technology is great. Okay, Thomas, we're ready for you. Okay, I'm Thomas Scaldron, and uh, I'm happy to be here. I hope you enjoy my presentation or find something insightful that you could use or talk about. Um, the last time I did something on the future of the accounting profession, it was not quite about the accounting profession. It was about everything that had to do with IT, year 2000, and I got it wrong, okay? Many of you know that story. Well, I learned my lesson. And so I'm not going to give you anything definitive in terms of what will happen in the next 5, 10, 15 years. But I'll tell you some of the concerns and how the profession might change as a result of those concerns. Um, my, my presentation is outlined right here. You can see I'll talk a little bit about the perspectives of the domain. That's very quick. Uh, changes in the environment, that should be very quick. And hopefully I should end up with uh, changes in services offered, preparation for the accounting profession, in other words, education, that's pretty important, and future challenges and opportunities. That's essentially the gist of my presentation. And if I'm forced to, I might stop right here. I've done it. <laughs> Keep going. Now, perspectives. We could spend many hours talking about perspectives. But what I'd like to say is that the accountant profession is like an elephant. And you'll see why I say that in a couple of minutes. It's huge. And depending on what you touch, you're going to have a different perspective. So if you look at the financial markets perspective, that's one big area. Then a practitioner service perspective, which is what I'm going to focus on mostly, that's another big giant area. Corporate compliance, corporate governance, that's yet another area. And then finally, corporate strategy and operations, what we traditionally think of as management accounting. Each of these perspectives add many dimensions to the accounting profession. And um, the profession will change depending on the perspective that you're looking at. Each perspective will bring a different type of change to the profession. This is something like a SWOT analysis. Where is the profession right now? Well, as you could see, the profession is big. In the US alone, we have about 1.4 million people working in accounting jobs. Now, this is from the Department of Labor, so it understates what we do in accounting, okay? 1.4 million accounting jobs. 10% growth. This is actually very good for accounting, accounting students and accountants in general, compared with a 7% growth rate for all other professions. So this is, this is fabulous. Um, the other thing that you could see here is that based on the uh, Department of Labor statistics, the market for jobs is right around $98.7 billion. As I said, this is understated slightly, or perhaps by several multiples. From various sources, I'm able to figure out that I was able to figure out that the size of the market, the global market for accounting, is about $500 billion. There are three economies in Latin America that are bigger than this. Mexico, Argentina, and what do you think is the third one? All together, Brazil, okay? Um, expected growth rate for the world of accounting is seven to 10%. And then the expected size of the accounting services market by the year 2022 is going to be about $868 billion. That's billion with a B. So that's a huge elephant. 
Some of the th factors that have triggered growth, and this is not an exhaustive list, mergers and acquisitions, technology. Everyone talks about technology, and it's not just in the accounting profession. So naturally, it is going to trigger growth. Change management related to financial reporting regulation and standards. Well, one of the big things that happens with governments and regulatory authorities is that they are always trying to go to the next holy grail. In 2002, the government of the US legislated what corporate governance should look like. And guess what? It brought full employment to the accounting profession. It's a pattern. The government tries to think, fix things, employment for accountants go up. And we love it because the numbers, the potential numbers, just keep on going up. Now, there are some constraints that we are going to have to deal with. And one of them is the possibility of weak global growth or perhaps even recessions in certain countries. The second one is something that is a concern for all of the accounting profession, service quality variations. And I don't have issues of independence in there because that's discussed <clears throat> by others on this group. Excuse me. <clears throat> Scandals and litigation. Artificial intelligence, data, and automation. All of these are constraints. Some of them may very well be opportunities and huge opportunities for that, for, for that matter. But having looked at this, it's important to bear in mind that we derive much of a competitive advantage from things like the perceived competence of the accounting profession, the perceived integrity of the, comp of the accounting profession, the perceived trust in the accounting profession. These are essentially foundation, or foundational in the accounting profession. And it's very important to recognize that if we should lose that, we could get into trouble as far as our profession is concerned <clears throat> and as far as growth in the profession is concerned. Here's another constraint that we need to be concerned about. Take a look at this statement. It came from a very active board member of the PCOB. Essentially what he is saying is that he is very concerned about concentration in the accounting profession or concentration of services in the hands of a few entities in the accounting profession. Why is he concerned? Just look at this. These are revenues for the big four accounting firms, as well as employment data for the big four accounting firms. I'm from a small island named St. Lucia originally, although I live in the United States and I've lived there for a long time. If we were to put all the big five in St. Lucia, well, we would increase the population by about maybe a thousand percent. Okay? Go ahead. <laughs> That's, it would sing the island. Okay? And um, it's it's actually a big profession. But take a look at this, which is even more revealing. Take a look at this. Take a look at the position of the big four that's in the US market relative to everybody else. The profession is huge, but the size of the profession is most evident among the big four. So we need to be concerned about that as we move into the future. And the PCOB, as well as regulators from all over, the, all over the world, are concerned about that. Some of you may not know that Deloitte, for example, is huge. It's the number one. But it's also the number one in the legal services profession. Data is going to change, and in fact has changed much of what we did or what we do in accounting. And um, Gini Romati made this statement in the context of information security. I'm not going to get into that. That's another dimension that 
could take days for us to discuss. But this is a very profound statement. To understand what that change really implies, take a look at what happened over the years to accounting. You could start off from the 1970s all the way to now. Couple of things that you should know. In the 1970s, all data that was captured was captured essentially manually. We key punched stuff. And in fact, there was a profession by the name of key punches or keyboardist, whichever one you want to refer to it as. And now, what we have? We have data entry at source. Every time you drive your car, you're creating data. And all that data goes into a centralized database somewhere in the world. Every time you use your phone, every time you order something on Amazon, you create new data. And as a result, the world is changing. People are actually creating new industries off of the information and data that you're generating. And then you go down, you could see that the regulatory standards, they are changing, but the basic patterns still exist. And to a very large extent, government and the regulators are not necessarily keeping up with the complexity of what's going on in the world. Oh, let me go back to something here, which is actually very, very important. Financial markets. Financial markets used to respond to daily or even annual information. Remember, we all used to issue annual financial statements. Well, the financial market re re responds now to nanosecond data. It happens, the market responds to it. And that's one of our big functions, to help the market be a lot more efficient. So this is going to change us, and it has changed us for the most part. Changes in services offered. I mentioned a while ago that one of the big changes was that Deloitte is one of the largest legal services firms in the world. The largest services, legal services firm in the world, it has $3 billion in total revenues. Do you know Deloitte's size in terms of total revenues? For legal services, $9 billion. So the profession is changing, and around the profession, we have things like law that we, come in, that we are embracing. We have things like advertising that we are embracing. We have things like human resource management that we are embracing. And recently, it's a very good thing, we have embraced artificial intelligence, analytics, and robotics. Education. Strange thing about education is that it has remained the same for probably all my life. Actually, not quite. Since the 70s, it has remained the same. And um, you could see the structure of a US-centric account in education. We spend about maybe uh, 60 credits on business and accounting and the remainder of the credits are spent on general broad education. Our students then go on in the states that allow us to sit with just a bachelor's degree. The students go on, pass the CPA exams, and voila, they are accountants, they are public accountants. They need a year of experience or two years of experience in certain states, but that's it. The interesting thing about that education, and it's not something that's affecting only accounting, it affects all disciplines. Much of the learning occurs at what you refer to as the knowledge level, the most basic level. And we have for a number of years trying to push that up so that we focus a lot more on what people refer to as critical thinking, anything above the application level. Unfortunately, I would say we have only a measured level of success in doing so. But once again, we do see disruptions, not just in the services market, but also in the uh, profession as we know it. And here is something that 
should be, that everyone in Harris should be alert to. Because of the way the profession is changing, and because of the uh, infusion of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, analytics and robotics into the accounting profession, we might go from what I refer to as a, uh, a triangle to something that is more like a diamond. Uh, in some firms, some of the legacy firms, we do have that, but it's for a different reason. The reason for this is going to be the displacement caused by technology. As an example, not public accounting, I do recall seeing hundreds of rows of accountants at Goodyear and at Firestone. Hundreds of rows. Today, well, I could count all of the accountants at Good Goodyear because most of them are my students. Basically, we went from having a lot of entry-level folks at Goodyear to a lot of mid-level folks at Goodyear. And then a few partners, a few CFOs, a few C-type individuals. The professional change that we are seeing will have a very, very significant impact on what the profession does and how the profession responds. So for example, today most accountants examine content. Well, what is going to happen in the future is that we would expect them to analyze context. Most accountants look at accounting insights. In the future, we might expect them to see business insights. And you go down the list, you notice that there is tremendous change coming in the accounting space. But when you think of accounting and transformative accounting, this is the picture that emerges. The skill set has to be technology focused. Instead of relying on manual processes, we are going to rely on cognitive services, which will use a lot of data and AI. The mindset, it has to be curiosity. It has to be creativity. And of course, it has to be skepticism. Ethics, independence, and trust, these are cornerstones. We can't depart from that. And then you look at the demand side issues. The demand side issues are tremendous. And the issue that scares me as an accountant is that we have moved into the legal space, okay, particularly outside of the US. The legal side has not moved into the accountant space very much. However, there is one firm I'm aware of that started off a financial forensics department in the United States. So we are going to see very, very intense competition, supply side issues, intensely competitive. And those of you who are in practice know that. And preparation for the, for the uh, profession, I would say that we have to re-engineer that so that we could focus on those types of skills back here. And finally, I would say that the transformation of the accounting profession is not an issue that we will be debating. I think it's an issue that we will be responding to. And the question is, when will that transformation take place? Thank you. Um, I guess you can tell from Thomas's passion that you might come from a small island, but you have big energy and big passion. Okay, Kim, we are ready for you. And um, thank you for being patient with us. So please join us. And Kim's going to share some insights about the work of the International Ethics Standards Board for Health. Hello everyone, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about some of the work that the IESBA is doing. Um, in our world today, the business environment is becoming increasing, increasingly complex and interchangeably connected. We continue with new business models 
advanced technology, increased regulatory oversight, and as such, there are greater and greater expectations for professional accountants to act ethically. These expectations exist whether you're a public accountant in private practice, in public practice, excuse me, or if you are a public accountant in business. The IESBA's mission is to serve the public interest by issuing high quality ethical standards along with independence requirements. Through a robust, globally operable code of conduct and having a single set of ethical standards can enhance the quality and consistency of the work done by professional accountants, thus resulting in the contribution to the public trust of the services provided by professional accountants. Before I get into some of the work that the IESBA is doing, I thought it would be helpful to just provide you with a little background as to who the IESBA is. Um, I know before I joined the board, I wasn't quite sure what IESBA meant, but it is the International Ethics Standards Board. Uh, the board is made up of 18 members, including a, an independent chair. There are nine practitioners and nine public members. There is um, wide global, uh, sorry, global representation on the board of at least 10 countries sitting around the table. And um, although independent from IFAC, IFAC does provide support to the IESBA and the other standard setting bodies. The IESBA debates the issues, the ethical issues facing the profession, and also has a due process with respect to discussing the issues and comments received. All meetings are public, so everyone here is more than welcome to join one of the four meetings that the IESBA does have a year. The code, as many of you know, is a globally accepted code. Currently, the code is, has been adopted or is being used in approximately 120 jurisdictions around the globe. My understanding is that Costa Rica, I'm happily to say, has partially adopted the code. Um, and we are continuing, continuing to work with this region for continued adoption. The code is also adopted in its entirety by the form of firms, which are the accounting networks, primarily for their transnational audits. The code um, has been translated into approximately 40 different languages, and I, for one, truly am a believer that the key to adoption is translation. So, with respect to the new code, there is a revised code, a revised and restructured code that has been, um, will be effective in June of 2019. The code is applicable to all public accountants, whether in business or in public accounting. The code is a principle-based code, which I believe is quite important and necessary for global adoption. It stimulates thinking with the use of the conceptual framework and really tries to move away from the ticking the box mentality. The code being a principle-based code, we do believe is relevant and fit for purpose now and will continue to be so in the future. The architect of the new code is quite user-friendly as a result of feedback we've had from our stakeholders. The code does have some specific rules or requirements that are designated by an R, so they're easily identified in the restructured code, and you will see many of them around, um, many requirements in the independence section of the code. Some of the key revisions to the revised and restructured code include an enhanced conceptual framework, 
the addition of the no clar standard, which is the non-compliance with laws and regulations, enhanced requirements on long association. There also are new provisions regarding pressure for the, pub, for the, for the accountant to breach the fundamental principles, as well as many, many other revisions. One thing, one area that the board is quite excited about is the issuance of an e-code. This is the first time the IESBA has ventured towards an e-code. It will be available at the end of June in connection with the effective date of the new and revised code. The e-code is a web-based tool where you can actually go in and search on words or topics. So for example, if you were interested in identifying all the prohibitions in the non-assurance service section, you can go put in a search word um, and you would be able to obtain the list of prohibitions. The e-code is based on a building block architect, architecture that will start with the conceptual framework use the fundamental principles, and then ultimately go to the topic that of, is of interest. Um, we are hosting a webcast on June 12th, next month, for our stakeholders and users to get a sneak peek at the tool and also learn the functionality associated with the e-code. So hopefully you'll join us on June 12th to get an idea of the e-code and how it can work for you. The IESBA has spent, I would say, a good part of a year and a half to two years working on its strategic work plan. The work plan is a five-year work plan that stretches from 2019 to, 20, to 2023. And to 20, sorry, there's a typo there, 2023. It's a five-year, very aggressive plan focusing on short-term and medium-term projects. In the short term, we are continuing to work on our role and mindset initiative, which I'll talk about. We are working on non-assurance services, looking at fees, of course, the rollout of the new code along with the e-code. In our more medium term, we will be looking at technology as there is a technology stream, which again, I'll talk about. And also, we will be focus on, focusing on tax planning in 2019. In addition to the rest of the work that's been identified in our strategic work plan, the IESBA continues to coordinate with the IAASB, which is the Accounting and Auditing Global Standard Setters. If you have any interest in looking at the full five-year work plan, please go to the IESBA's website. I did mention role and mindset, and this has been a project that has been in the works since 2018. In May of 2018, a um, con consultation paper was issued along with four global, um, global working groups where this topic was discussed. We primarily focused in the beginning on professional skepticism and whether or not professional skepticism is an attribute, an attribute that should be considered for all accountants. Upon further discussion and review, we quickly came to the realization that professional skepticism is a term used for auditors, and it is not a concept that should be applied to all professional accountants. However, there was the thought, well, what about a questioning mindset, professional judgment, a critical mindset? Should these concepts be applied across the board to all PAs? Um, there will be an exposure draft issued by the end of this year that discusses the role and mindset expected of professional accountants that, that address these issues please take the opportunity to review the exposure draft and provide comments if you, see, if you deem necessary. I did mention technology and our technology initiative. This is a 
crucial primary priority for the IESBA. There was a working group formed about a year and a half ago to start looking at technology with res in respect to the current code and future codes. The working group was to identify implications of technology with respect to the code and the relevance of the code. They are, we are looking to them to provide us recommendations going forward as to how technology impacts the profession as well as our code. And they also have spent the last year doing outreach and research. So the working group has spent time probably looking at every technology article there possibly can be, um, webcasts, podcasts. There have been stakeholder outreach. There are focus groups that have taken place. And as a result of the input, the discussion with our various stakeholders, five themes have emerged. The themes that you see here on the slide are the five that have been identified by the working group. The first is a common ethical, common ethical principles are also applicable to artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence, data mining, and robotics are the areas of focus of the working group. And it became clear that when dealing in this space, the fundamental principles identified in the code are relevant. Next is for professional accountants to have a mindset, a growth mindset. So moving away from a compliance mindset to one of advisory. And that will be important in the future working with technology. But what's important about that is the need to continue to use your professional judgment. The next theme is a bias that artificial intelligence is a significant risk. So what we have uncovered is that many, not only professional accountants, take the output of artificial intelligence as a given. The professional accountant needs to take responsibility for that output. Next is addressing the fair fairness and transparency. So how do these two concepts work together? How do you have transparency and fairness and manage that in the code when we have a confidentiality fundamental principle? And then finally, is there a responsibility to advise on risks and benefits of technology? The working group are looking at whether or not a professional accountant does have a responsibility to inform third parties as to, as to the risks and the benefits of the technology that they may be working with, whether themselves or their clients. So again, we expect the report in December. I would <clears throat> expect that there be questions around how in fact technology does impact the code, how do we manage transparency in connection or next to confidentiality, and ultimately, what is the auditor, I'm sorry, the professional accountant's responsibility going forward with respect to technology? So thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you regarding the work of the IESBA. Um, and I'll turn it back to Sylvia. Thank you, Kim. And a lot of times when we go to events, we're often asked what the standard setters are doing with respect to technology, and it's great and really exciting to see what Kim's just shared with us. Okay, we've got about 10 to 12 minutes left for questions, and um, let me take a seat here, and I think our panel, okay, we're just gonna answer some questions. All right. Are these working? Yes, everyone can hear me? Okay, Monica, why don't we start with you, because you started us off, and you had some great insights from the S&P survey, and I took a note of them. Um, you mentioned that skills had to change and transformation was going to happen. And we often hear something called soft skills, so non-technical skills. What do you think are ways we can introduce and educate future young accountants on soft skills? One key aspect relates to 
identifying and putting a lot of energy on new trends. So uh, the new generation and the new world requires professionals to be and to react in a very holistic approach. So not focusing only on technical aspects, but also working integrated to other professions and to other perspectives and understanding a more complete, a more holistic scenario. So uh, the involvement of soft skills and having this available to the practitioners practitioners will allow them to be properly prepared to face all what is changing uh, in the world. How do firms identify uh, how to supply the adequate soft skills to the staff? It requires the involvement and participation in events or together with other firms' colleagues. So it's about identifying what is being needed and what's coming next not only related to accounting and audit, but also in all different issues, all other aspects that exist, including the needs of the client. So what comes as a trend to the client needs to be understood by the staff. And that relates very strongly to soft skills. So accompanying what comes as new trend and selecting the best alternatives to supply or to allow the staff to understand the soft skills that will prepare the practitioners to face that. I think one of the aspects you're sharing with us is that they have to participate more in understanding the client, having the communication relationship building skills to better understand the challenges they're facing and support them, whether they're in the audit process or business process. Okay, great. Thomas, you refer to uh, Ginny Romady and then also a lot of references to technology and we still got Kim's slide on technology here. And you mentioned analytics and robotics. Do you, can you share with us some specific examples you've come across in terms of how technology and the digital environment might affect accountants or the profession. Any people always find specific examples helpful. Yeah, if you go back to uh, 2001, I did a paper, just a survey of how corporations uh, dealing with data mining. At that time, I didn't refer to it as an analytics. And uh, in 2001 about 35% of corporations that responded, including a lot of firms, said they had done absolutely nothing with data mining. Now, we had a typology of data mining, which was a very low level queries. Okay, that's very low level. Then we went to online analytical processing. And then we went to some of the more esoteric types of analytical processing. What is interesting about today's environment is that there are new tools and lots and lots of data that make all those levels available to the public accountant, from basic queries in SQL all the way up to neural networks and uh, other machine learning techniques. Couple of examples, very quickly. And this is, this is something that is available to everyone in here. Microsoft has an application called Microsoft BI Desktops. Every one of us who works in the profession have seen a list of revenue transactions, 100% of revenue transactions. And many of us who have gone through auditing over the years, we focus on samples. Well, today, you could take that 100% list in Microsoft BI, create a dashboard to identify where your risk points are. And that's very easy to do, very quick to do as well, utilizing 100% of your data. In addition, another thing that you could do with that is you could look at milestones and cutoffs, okay, to see what happens to risky data around milestones. A simple mi milestone would be the end of the month. That's a milestone, the end of the year, the end of a quarter. Bad things happen around those times. And so that's just one example. 
Great, thank you. If we have time, we might come back for another example. Kim, if I can ask you two questions. One's really quick and easy, so hope you don't mind. Let me ask that one first. You mentioned the e-code, and you mentioned the word apps, so everyone's probably thinking, when can they get this? And will it work on Android and Apple devices? Because I've been asked this question about it. Okay. Too. That's a ve very easy question, actually. <laughs> so the app will be available end of June. It is a web-based application, so you can go onto your computer and use it. But also, it is available iPhone, Android, um, iPad. So it will be readily available. Um, to, to our stakeholders and users. Great, and I think they can get more information on the IASBA yes, website. Yes, absolutely, okay. the IASBA website has all the information, including being able to register for the webinar June 12th. Thank you, Dean. Okay, great, and if I can continue on, give you a harder question, because I think that's only fair. I know you didn't have enough time to cover everything IASBA is doing, but can you help us understand the current project to revise what we call the NAS provisions in the code, what the project covers, and what that might look like in relation to um, work that you've explained today. Sure. I'm actually on the NAS, which is the Non-Audit Services Task Force. And their, uh, our objective is quite different than what we talked about today. Technology and technology services being performed for audit clients would naturally fall within that um, the NAS project. However, the technology projects, I just want to make it very clear, really revolves around the ethical ramifications of technology with respect to professional accountants. So the NAS um, project, we are looking at the non-assurance uh, non services currently in the code primarily in the PI, the public interest entity space, and looking at whether or not the prohibitions, the restrictions are appropriate. And appropriate based on perception, public perception, regulator perception, the um, client perception, investor perception of performing non-assurance services that potentially can have a self-review threat for an audit client. So we are going through the section of the code, looking to see if changes need to be made. We are also looking at communication with those charged with, those charged with sorry, for those charged with governance and determining whether or not there needs to be some requirements, again, in the PI space for communication between the auditor and the audit committee with respect to non allowable non-assurance services and corresponding fees. So there's more work being done in that space also, but those really are the highlights of, of what we're looking at. We are going to the board with a draft in June. There is expectation that an exposure draft will, take, will, will be issued by the end of the year. So please keep an eye out for that. It will have some significant changes and could very well impact everybody in this room. So your comments and thoughts on what we put out are great, is greatly appreciated. Great, thank you, Kim, for taking on those notes too. Monica, back to you. I've got a question related to technology, but before I ask the question, I'm not sure if people in the room are aware, but IFAC recently translated 14 articles from Monica's uh, SMP committee into Spanish to deal with issues like talent attraction, how do you deal with competition or pressure to lower audit fees, as well as technology. So if you haven't received those, please come and see Monica or my colleague Manuel, and they can help you get access to these Spanish articles. My question is, for technology, you encourage individuals to develop a business plan, so treat it like a business opportunity. What are some additional steps SMPs can do in terms of this and the benefits and risks they probably will have to face along the way? Well, let me make an additional comment on your first comment uh, that I didn't mention during my presentation. Uh, not sure if everyone here uh, is aware and accesses the Global Knowledge Gateway. So if you don't, you might enter into IFAC's website 
and it immediately opens to the Global Knowledge Gateway. There you will find related to different uh, topics a lot of material relate, including articles, videos, etc. And within these articles, as Sylvia mentioned, there are already available some articles related to the topics I mentioned here on this new, uh, on, on this challenging aspects related to the SMPs, which are already translated in Spanish and which include a lot of different tips and key areas to be focused. So I really stimulate you to check at the Global Knowledge Gateway. Specifically in relation to your question, I think uh, what is mainly important is to have an adequate balance and appropriate balance of the tech strategy in relation to the company strategy. What does it mean? It includes to consider uh, remote, the, the need and uh, the applicability of remote access, documents management and scanning, so depending on your needs and on your client's uh, reality, multi-screens, website improvements, all that uh, ought to be properly balanced to make sure that when you focus on developing a tech strategy, you are putting all your resources and energy on what will work according to your reality. If you choose properly this, define properly the strategy and choose properly what will be implemented at the firm, as I mentioned before, certainly you achieve a reduction of costs, a better communication with your clients, a better environment with your team, because uh, the operations tend to flow in a smoother way. So keep attention on that to make sure you are not putting effort on something that will become at the end of the day useless to your firm. Thank you. I think that's a really good point about remote versus scanning and basics to start with. Okay, we've got, I'm gonna say two minutes, even though we went on, let's get another question to you, Thomas. Since you're in the education sector and you've had a huge amount of exposure to education and seeing how your students have moved into the field, what's an insight you can share with us in terms of what the future of accounting education looks like? You touched on it in your slides, but what's another point for us to uh, look towards for the future? The one thing I would say about account education is that for the most part, at least in the U.S., we are part of a very important supply chain. In the U.S., we are part of a very important supply chain for the uh, public accounting profession. And so uh, we usually work closely with the public accounting profession as well as industry to assist us in identifying what's coming next. One thing that we hear all of the time is that we need soft skills, okay? That's a given. That's table stakes, okay? Every student that graduates from an accounting program or a business program needs to have the appropriate soft skills. However, given the way that the profession is heading or direction in which the profession is heading and in which business is heading, we need to make a shift from all of that rote memorization that you see in accounting programs, on professional exams, etc. One individual said to me, it makes no sense to test a student on something that the student could spend one second and find the correct answer for, okay? One second is a bit of exaggeration. On the other hand, that student would be a lot more efficient in finding answers if the student had a heavy dose of professional accounting research, okay? Similarly, it makes no sense to teach students, let's say, how does the market react to a, an audit failure? It makes no sense to do that. It makes a lot more sense for the student to find out for himself or for herself how the market reacts. So in other words, one of the things that will happen as we move in the future with accountant education, you'll see a greater emphasis on professional research. You'll see a greater emphasis on analytics. 
and most definitely, you will see us spending a lot more time on ethics and professional responsibility. And our ethics and professional responsibility will, of course, talk about things that are at the root level, the basics. But at the same time, we are going to go beyond just awareness, beyond just road basics. We are going to go into ethical judgment as well as ethical decision making. Thank you very much for that insight. Thankfully, most of us won't be going back to school. But if you have a daughter, son, niece, nephew who's going to go to school in the U.S., tell them to look up the University of Akron. <laughs> and just to conclude, I want to thank, thank, the bitch. thank everyone else. And plus, both uh, Kim and Monica, the boards and committees they represent, please go to their websites. There's lots of information. I know the SMP committee has a practice development guide that's brand new and has a hundred pages guidance on technology and how SMPs can move into it. So I'd like to conclude. Please help me in thanking our team here with a round of applause. And um, they will be making their way back into the main plenary room where you should join us for the close, one more session before closing. So thank you for your participation today.